Welcome to the Manx Theatre Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to episode 42 of the Manx Theatre Podcast with me, Neil Callan. Thank you to everyone who's listened to our previous episodes. If you're brand new to the podcast, welcome along and thanks for joining us. In this podcast, we like to try and keep you up to date with what's going on in theatre on the Isle of Man, chatting to the cast and creatives of upcoming shows to find out a little bit more about the shows and the people behind them, and also what our Manx-born and bred performers are doing further afield. Coming up on this week's podcast... I'm joined by Charlie Williams and Alexander Armstrong from Paradise Theatre Company as they announced the auditions for their July production of Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. You can still listen to all of our previous episodes through all the usual podcast outlets and at manxradio.com forward slash podcasts. Whilst you're there, make sure to give us a like and click subscribe or follow or whatever it is you need to make sure you never miss an episode. In the last episode, I gave you a rundown of the known productions coming up at the Gaiety this year. So let's have a look at what's happening out of town. At the Aaron Arts Centre in Port Erin from Wednesday the 25th of January to Friday the 27th, the Russian players will be presenting Secondary Cause of Death by Peter Gordon. This is a spoof of an Agatha Christie style whodunit with Inspector Pratt, who was quite possibly the most, the most ineffective detective you will have ever met, trying to solve the murders as the bodies pile up. Hot on its heels is the Young Singer of Man competition for 7 to 18 year olds. The junior competition has taken place at 2pm on Saturday the 28th of January and the senior competition is the following day at 2pm on Sunday the 29th. Tickets are available for both events through the Erin Arts Centre website at erinartscentre.com. At Peel's Centenary Centre from the 2nd to the 4th of March, the Legion players in their 90th year are presenting A Bunch of Amateurs by Ian Hislop and Nick Newman. The play tells the story of fading American Hollywood action hero Jefferson Steele, who arrives in England, desperate to boost his flagging career. His plan? To play the iconic King Lear at Stratford. However, he should have checked the map. This Stratford is not the birthplace of the Bard, but a sleepy village in Suffolk. And the cast are a bunch of amateurs trying to save their theatre from developers. Where monstrous ego, vanity and insecurity collide with enthusiastic Amdram thespians, it is pure drama. Tickets are available from etickets.im forward slash cc or from Celtic Gold in Michael Street Peel. The King's Court Theatre continue their season of live screenings from the Royal Opera and the Royal Ballet, including The Barber of Seville and Cinderella and National Theatre Live, which includes screenings of The Crucible, Othello, starring Giles Torreira, the original West End Aaron Burr, Life of Pi, Good, starring David Tennant, and The Best of Enemies, starring David Harewood and Zachary Quinto. Many of these screenings will also be available at the Balakamine Studio Theatre too. Make sure you keep up to date with what's going on between episodes by following Manx Theatre Podcast on both Facebook and Instagram and at Manx Theatre Pod on Twitter. Right, down to business. Joining me on the podcast now, sadly not in the studio because the uh, the recent snow has been against us, but joining me now on Zoom are Charlie Williams and Alex Armstrong from Paradise Theatre Company. Charlie, Alex, welcome back. Hello, thank you very much. Hello, thank you for having us, yeah. Yeah, um, no, I've been, I've been, I've got lockdown memories now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got the PTSD. You'll start picking. <laughs> so, the guys, last time that last time we spoke was uh, just before Easter last year, and you were on to promote Much Ado About Nothing, which you're doing at King's Court Theatre, which was your debut production. Yeah. How did that go yeah. for you? Fantastically well. Um, it, it feels like yesterday that we were in talking about Much Ado, but. Subject to any contrary comments from my learned partner, Alex, I think it was a very successful production. We've only been hearing good things. And I think we hopefully in a good way surprised a few people uh, based on what we were wanting to achieve. And we kind of put our money where our mouths were and came out and achieved it. Brilliant. Yeah, I think when we when we thought back or thinking back now to what we were saying at the time, I, I think the two of the key points that we were making were that there seemed to be this misconception that either... There wasn't the acting talent on the Isle of Man to pull off Shakespeare and or there wasn't the audience out there who actually wanted to go and watch it. And I think this production 
really demonstrated to us that actually that that wasn't true. Uh, we we managed to pull it off. It was very well received by by people. Certain people who I think there's certainly one or two that came to come and watch the production who hadn't really been to the theatre necessarily before. They might have remembered it from when they were at school, the story, and they were pleasantly surprised. And we got lots of positive feedback from those that came, and a tremendous amount of support from from the uh, theatre community on the Isle of Man. It's always great when others go sort of come and watch um, new shows and, and come and support uh, support these things. So, so yeah, went really, really well for us. Great. I mean, I I went and I I really enjoyed it myself. I love Shakespeare, and Much Ado About Nothing is one of my favourites as well. So, I was it was great to go, to finally get sort of get see that in person as well. Yes, yeah, no, really think, good. Uh, go no, on, after you. you. Okay, well, I was just going to say, I think that the um, uh, you know, it, it was it was one that we wanted to start with. We we discussed. It you know which of the Shakespeare plays if we're going to do one to go with it's a good all-rounder and um it, it's it's you know it's, it's, a, it's a warm feeling play and I think that the response we got you know I was having having been in it one of the and also being one of the, the producers of the show and being in it I had the the nerve-wracking moment for the first show before walking on and you're listening to the audience and you're seeing what the response is going to be and when we got the first laugh I went okay we've this hasn't fallen on its face <laughs> straight away. <laughs> this has actually, people are responding, we've done this okay. And yeah, all, all, everybody, and, and I suppose most in, most importantly in some ways our sponsors uh, were very happy <laughs> yes. with what they yes. saw and we got we got very good feedback back and, and are continuing to do so from people that we meet. Uh, I sometimes go to events and I'll bump into somebody randomly and I'll say, I recognise you, were you in this? It was very good. Um, and I'll go. Well, not only was he in it, I actually uh, helped put it on. So, <laughs> so yeah. So we're, we're very happy. And we had Peter Wicks and uh, Lisa Smith in the, the lead roles as Benedict and Beatrice as well, and they were they were fantastic. I mean, they they both came onto the podcast and chat last time as well. But yeah. fantastic performances from them. Peter was just brilliant. Yes, no, he was. Uh, he, Peter was 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 fantastic. Uh, Lisa was great, and, and everybody in the cast, to be honest, really came into their own really helped us pull their weight because we relied you know whilst obviously it was it was our show so to speak we relied very heavily on, on the support from the cast and also from the production team from the director downwards um because we you know it was a new thing for us it was our debut production mm-hmm. whilst we have experience in that theater world Alex and I were spinning a number of plates. And so to have a cast that you could trust who did the job, who came in and nailed it was fantastic. And they, they would happily work with any of them again. Um, they were great. I think a, lot of the, a lot of the cast sort of surprised themselves a little bit as well and, and mm. certainly surprised the audience. There were certainly some names in there that people wouldn't necessarily associate with being able to, to pull off Shakespeare. Um, I, there, there were a fair few individuals who... Um, who really shone through. Uh, I think Dandy Dancox in particular, I, yeah. I was really, really impressed with her as, as to how well she managed it, uh, being her first sort of first proper play and then certainly her, her first Shakespeare. It was odd when Charlie and I were talking afterwards because we, we reshuffled the cast slightly on the, on the run-up to it just to move some people around a little bit. And it was so strange to look back after the performance and think, I'm not entirely convinced that it would have worked as it was originally sort of yeah. uh, as mm. we originally thought about it, so yeah, and and and, and always sort of hats off to, to to David Dawson there and Sarah Holland for their fantastic input, leading it into being the director and assistant director respectively, and, yeah. and actually and, <clears throat> ensuring that it, that it did come onto the stage and that it was it was in a good place and the people enjoyed it. Yes, and, and and Jude for making us all look good as she always does. I think oh, yes. in every play, um, every play and performance on the island was 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 consummate in 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 bringing. She brought Heidi in as well, who assisted with with hair and makeup. And, you know that was it, it's people like that who who are so well known and so uh, reputable in the theatre industry on the island who were willing to take a chance. Uh, you know, on two guys who said we've come up with this idea and we'd really like you to be involved. <laughs> um, I think they. And, I think the wake, the makeup, and the the wardrobe on pretty much every show that goes on at the moment is organised by Jude, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, you've got, you've got somebody who knows what they're doing. You, you stick with it, don't you? But it's uh, no, they, they they were all great, and it and it meant that we're able to now say, hopefully, with some confidence, we've we've kind of put our mark on the theatre scene on the island. We're, we're a rep, a company who has the backing of 
a successful performance behind them rather than coming out going please come and see this because even though we've never done anything before and you have no idea who we are there is you know maybe paradox or, or ring a bell in somebody's head and they're more likely to take a chance and of course the success of that means that this year you're back again with another show yes uh, yes we're gluttons for punishment really <laughs> <laughs> And that's obviously the reason why we're we're chatting this evening. So this year then, on July 5th to the 8th, you're doing The Merchant of Venice. Yes, we are. So a, a conversation was had between Charlie and I sort of towards the end of what to do of, okay, we, we, we think we're going to do another one. What should we do? Uh, and there was a bit of a short list going and a sort of bit of a to and fro. And I think we, we settled on The Merchant of Venice, one that we both recognised and agreed to and and again a storyline that that certain people perhaps not as certainly not as popular or, or as well known as as much ado was but it's certainly a story that people probably have a little bit of an idea of, of sort of the background to it they may well have seen uh the sort of al pacino film yes um, they may well have some relationship to it so yeah so that's what we settled for so yeah, Al Pacino think, is not someone you'd really automatically associate with Shakespeare, though, is it? <laughs> no, no, he's not. And I thought he did a fantastic job in it, to be honest. It was, it was ironically for Al Pacino, an understated performance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there wasn't any yelling or anything involved. And it, and it is, if anybody's looking for an, kind of an entry into the, into, the, into the show, we would recommend seeing that, I think, because it's, it's a good, more modern portrayal of it, but also kind of, kind of, are honest to the roots of the, of the play but but yeah as, as Alex said we we wanted to do something that was you know again not so well known or long or that, that we're trying you know we're gonna have to put in you know we need a castle or something for and various other things I think I think we wanted something that was we liked the the intimacy of much ado to a certain degree that we were able to use with that and Merchant of Venice gives you that same frame of performance in that you can have that more intimate approach to the audience and it's it's familiar enough I think to people that, that that they'll be able to go. Oh, well, I'll, I'll go and see that. And we've had from telling people already, and we advertised it in the program at the time, and we've we've kind of been doing some advertising since. There's been a positive reaction to that as well. There's quite a few people who said, "Oh, I'd like to go uh, and see that." And more importantly, I think from our angle, and I'm sure we'll go on to a discussion. Uh, there's a number of actors now who said they'll want to audition for it. Uh, Brilliant. So we are. Uh, so which is great, <laughs> you know, rather than. Just Alex and I having to do a two-hander wearing different wigs. Hopefully, we might have one or two other people who are interested in coming along as well. So uh, I, I, that's uh, that's that's really positive. Brilliant. So over the last week, then you've started to release some little sort of biographies of some of the characters that are, are up to be auditioned. Yeah. So again, just supporting that that idea that some people might know the storyline a little bit, but but not necessarily, uh, and, and not necessarily know the characters. Uh, we thought we'd sort of release a couple of little character profiles just to plant those seeds as as to um, explaining who these characters are, how they fit together, uh, and, and perhaps a little bit about their their personalities. Just to sort of spark interest, perhaps for someone who's out there looking at this and going, I don't necessarily know the storyline. I don't I haven't done Shakespeare before. I, I, I don't know who I'm right for, but I want to be involved. Uh, it's just giving them a little bit of information there, uh, just to as I say, just have a think about uh, and understand those characters a little bit better without having to go off and do a massive amount of research themselves. Yeah, and I, and I think it's also to try and... <laughs> <laughs> just holding up my uh, just... com- complete works of Shakespeare there. Your yeah, research. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, a lot, you're, you're very prepared. Um, I think that the... Um, I think also it, it's useful for people because it's trying to break down that wall i think that a lot of people have with shakespeare of thinking oh it's horrendously complicated or it or it's for very accomplished actors and i couldn't you know even think about entertaining trying to audition for that or, or doing that or it's or it's not something that's really interested me because it's very wordy or quite archaic language i think if you you know by trying to just explain the basic points about these characters and who they are it allows a point of reference for those who are wanting to audition for those roles and also it kind of makes people go, oh, it's a little bit more relatable and it's OK, maybe I will consider doing that because, you know, we're still pushing the message. You know, I, I used the phrase, I think, earlier before, if we'll put my money where our mouths are. We are very aware of what we said we wanted this company to be when we started mm-hmm. uh, on, on your podcast and publicly elsewhere. And I think that we're wanting to keep that keep that ball rolling, you know, when we 
for the first show, it was it was cast were approached and the, and the production team was put together because it was our first show. This show we're going where well, we want to we want to start getting into our no we want it open to as many people as possible. So we're auditioning for the actual cast, keeping the same production team for that consistency, and then as we go forward, that will expand further. So we we are we're wanting as many people who previously may have just gone no I'm just musicals, you know as as, as the cast of the last show. She, demonstrated that doesn't matter you know you come outside your comfort zone come and try something else and also for people who might be new to acting who've thought i want to try and give it a go who, who then then you know come along and audition as well because it's 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 we're looking for the best people to be in the performance and that might not necessarily be the people who are you know often in shows yeah i mean that was something that i saw um when i went to see lgs for angels punks and raging queens mm. So obviously you didn't see because you were busy on stage with Dylan for yes. murder. I was really um, annoyed about that because I heard really I, good things. I saw. Alex, Alex <laughs> saw it. Alex saw it. We've always I, got one person from Paradox turning up to something yeah, when if, if I, you really I, can't I, make it. Yeah, I was in the Gaiety as well, I think. So I, I went and watched one of their dress ones, which was very nice at least to, uh, yes. to allow us in to, to watch that end as well. I mean, it was great. Yes. It was a cast of 35 people. And of those 35, there was probably... 10 or 12 that you're used to seeing in musicals and stuff all the time. But then there yeah. were other people that were brand new people that you see at the back of things. And they all, mm. with the nature of the piece, they all stood and they all had their little, their own little monologues. It was fantastic seeing these people thinking I've never seen him yeah. before, but he's great. And I'm looking forward to see him in more. So. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think that that's what we're wanting to do. And we found even with much ado that there were, there were performance in that because the problem, the thing with Shakespeare is there's not really any, that's going to sound really cliche. There's not really any small roles. Yeah, you know, he he writes very specifically when you're when you're the character in the play. They're there for a specific reason. They might only have a few lines, but there are lines and they have involvement. And so even the lower tertiary characters, you know, a handmaid or something like this, is going to have quite a developed character who has to do or say something. And so we had performers in Much Ado who were used to being, as you say, in chorus roles who were then kind of were taking a step up with us by going, well, no, I will come in and I'll, you know, we were saying, well, we think you'd be quite good for this. Why don't you read for this and come in and perform and and, and do that? And, and they were great. You know, it was, it was, it was great to see that develop the confidence and develop their abilities. So then you see them later on going in and doing bigger things going forward. Yeah. I mean, ben Gale last year, um, he mm. played a, little, a smaller part in that. But before that, I don't think I've ever seen him do anything other than, than chorus ensemble work and then yeah. come september he was one of the t-birds in, uh, in yeah. Greece. Yeah. yeah and 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 knocked him dead i think in it and, and yeah. ben was great you know you know kelly firth is another example somebody who who, who i think really stepped up and did a great job and, and mm. demonstrated that these you know, these guys have the ability to be in leading roles no problems uh, and and we want that we want to give people who think that they're not necessarily, you know, they want to try it out or they want to try something new, that opportunity. So how many, how many parts, how many, how many people are you, are you looking for, for, for Merchant of Venice? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of, all, of all the questions I thought I just prepped for, that one wasn't the right, I, I've got the list, I'll have to very quickly count now. I'll, 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 give, I'll, I'll give I'll give my daughter's answer to this sort of thing. Lots and lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've got, in terms of the main characters, you've got obviously you've got Shylock, um, which is the one everybody knows. You've then got Antonio, who's the Merchant of Venice. He's the person that the play is really named after. It's reason as with a lot of Shakespeare plays, it's reasonably male heavy. The show, I'm going to admit, hold my hands up. But what I would say is that the three primary female roles in this show are some of the strongest female characters I think Shakespeare's written to a certain mm -hmm. degree. You know, Portia is the classic example of, you know, a strong independence beyond the fact that she has to uh, submit to her father's will as to who she seeks to, as, as a partner. But is, is is the language of her speeches and, and her phrasing in the show and, and what she ends up doing at the, at the end of it, you know, is... is quite feminist in to a certain degree. Um, there are no uh, there are no mild men and women in Shakespeare, are there? No, no, he wrote he wrote reasonably well for and you know obviously there's you know of the time and there's some exceptions and, and uh, you know taming of the shrew you can take whatever whatever you <laughs> like about that show. But in terms of this play, I think that Portia, Narissa and Jessica are three quite well written characters who all bring their own independent and strong it will, will will allow for rather, I think, an independent, strong approach from from the actors that takes it on, um, yeah. and, and we can draw. You know, hopefully, we can draw that out. 
So we would encourage anybody who thinks that they want to go for those. And we've already had some comments on Facebook posts and things about people are going, oh, and you can tell from the certain, you know, if you, when people are liking the certain descriptions that are being put up as to who maybe might be langling for certain things and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. right? But, you know, you've got, so you've got Charla from Antonio. So they're the, so there's three basically key female characters. And then you have Charla from Antonio who uh, are, you know, Sherlock actually, I think is only in, five scenes in the yeah. whole play so whilst yeah, he's, 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 not load, massive, he's, he's not a actually in it very often um, but he has some of the biggest obviously, speeches and the most well-known speech i think yeah. from it. and then antonio who's in there bassiano who is the main kind of love interest and then really it's kind of a it's a, in many ways a play about three love interests which is bassiano and portia lorenzo and jessica graciano and and nerissa and and their their stories as well so it, it's you know, some people kind of go, oh, it's a play about X. Yeah. But really, it's it's as as a, with all of Shakespeare's plays, it's actually got several different strands that are all running. He sends he sends a number of hairs running at the same time and says, keep track of these, um, yeah. and, and they all neatly come together at the end. So it's, it's I think we're probably, I don't know, Alex, if you've done the maths in the time I've been talking, but it's... I have, it, it, I have indeed. So we're, excellent. Total, we're looking around sort of fifth, between sort of 15 and 17. There we are. Um, so there's sort of 15 main sort of actual roles uh, that that are that have a description to them, and then there will be some sort of ensemble type roles. So for somebody who just wants to be involved, perhaps with just very little to say, yeah. uh, or they might end up doubling up and playing two separate characters, then then there's options there. Uh, so you know, the Duke of Venice, for example, uh, is is only in one scene right at the, the very end. So um, it, it's it's a Relatively big role for that one scene, but but beyond that, less so. Yeah, uh, which I think so, yeah, think about it, fifty in total. Yeah, and that lends itself to you know people's different levels of commitment and what they're wanting to do with it, and we can we can play around with that. And something that we did with Much Ado, which was successful, is that we tried to run quite a professional short rehearsal period. You know, we're not running for months and months and months. This is on in July, early July, I think, uh, from fifth through to the eighth. <laughs> I think that the in terms of your actual rehearsing time, we won't include TT. We're probably running from is it early June, Alex, that we were thinking of late, late May, early June in terms of an actual Mid- rehearsal middle period. Of May. Middle, of May. middle of May. So that's not long. 15th of you know, May it, is the it, week of our blocking. So that, yeah, it's, all, it's all find May. out. <laughs> my, my 30th birthday is the week of our blocking. Um, so I think that the, 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 you know, what we're looking for in commitment from people is that's the period of time. You're not doing it for months and months. We're not doing the auditions in February and then we're kicking straight off in March. You know, this isn't this isn't a big, massive musical. But at the same time, we'll be wanting to work with the cast and wanting to give them the opportunity to, to talk through what they want from the role and what they're looking for. Uh, and, and I think that, that that worked well previously and, and is kind of the approach we'll be taking this time around as well. So six, seven weeks, hard work, and you're on. Yeah, yeah really, yeah. yeah. It was a- it was a slightly different approach to perhaps what people might be be used to, and I think when we did it for the for Much Ado, there was perhaps a little concern amongst the cast of, oh, is this actually going to work? And actually, when we finished and we sort of invited feedback from everybody as to, you know, this was our first one, you know, come and tell us what you thought. They were all quite positive about the whole thing and, and thought actually that the, the way that we approached it worked quite well they knew exactly where they needed to be on what day at what time well in advance and, and it was just easy in that respect um yeah. and and so we were, that's the plan this time of uh, yeah selecting a cast having a meet up and a read through here's your script there it is go go away and um have a look at your lines start to learn them maybe meet up with other people if you want a, a venue to do that in then let us know we'll catch up periodically in that time do a little bit of character development maybe a, a, another read through and then come to blocking ready to go um and then that quite intensive intensive period but it just means committing less time than than perhaps uh, somebody might be used to yeah mm. but there's, there's nothing quite like that pressure of a short rehearsal period to get you off book a lot quicker <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean we, we, with our approach we kind of go as much off book as you can before we kick off is yeah. great because then we can you know get get the ball rolling but in terms of the will we recognize you depending on the role that you're taking on and uh, naturally occasionally there's some edits as you go through but but we last time we found it worked really well people responded to it from both sides whether they classically done plays or whether they're usually in musicals where the 
rehearsal periods differ wildly and in different approaches they all you know everybody was was quite happy with the way that we did it so we thought well if it ain't don't broke don't fix it yeah so last year you were at uh, king's court theater this year you've decided to up the ante a little bit i believe Yes, we're going to do it on the moon. No, we're, <laughs> um, we're, we are not with the failed British space launch recently. I don't think we, that's a good idea. Um, we're going to be, I think that the month that we've decided on for the play is indicative of what we're planning to do, ideally. People have asked us, what are you, what are you intending to do? Are you going to do it at King's Court again? King's Court was a fantastic venue. We really enjoyed it. The audiences really enjoyed it. The actors really enjoyed the space. It's a lovely, intimate space. And we have cheekily in some ways provisionally got that in as our backstop for in the event of wet weather or other issues. But yep. primarily we're looking at an outdoor venue this time around because we think that we would like to do it as a bit of an event. Um, Shakespeare outdoors is a lovely experience if, if the weather's good. And, you know, we've proven that Max... Uh, actors can do this. We've proven the Manx audiences want to see it. So why don't we give them something a bit different? I think is I think is the approach that we're we're looking at now. So yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I mean I think like sort of twenty years back, you'd you'd go and see Shakespeare in the Castle at Peel, wouldn't you? Or uh, mm. I think they also did it in Russian Abbey one year, and possibly I think the Wash yeah. Floor in Laxey as well. I think I remember seeing one down there. Yeah, yeah, I think I yeah. saw it was the Tempest, the Wash Floor in Laxey. I saw, uh, but I've I mean, seen it. Ultimately, Russian... there's there's nothing better really than sitting on a picnic blanket with a, with a bit of food, maybe a glass of wine, enjoying some Shakespeare in the setting sun. I mean, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't think of a better way to spend the July evening. <laughs> <laughs> You'll you be a lighting Castle, box, you do, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Although in Peel Castle, um, you do tend to have to uh, battle the seagulls a little bit, so... Yes, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, yes, it's, it, we're looking at various ventures. And I think what, what's great about the Isle of Man is that there is so many different outdoor spaces that you can look at yeah. that offer different things. You know, if you're looking for, you know, Peel Castle is emblematic of plays such as, you know, if you think of like you did Macbeth or Hamlet or something mm. there, you know, it's ideal. Russian Abbey, to be honest, you could do any of them anywhere. And we're very lucky. You know, Alex and I, in some ways, are lucky that we are spoiled for choice to a certain degree of venues to choose from on the Isle of Man, whether it's through Manx National Heritage, who are fantastic in terms of assisting and being open to the potential use of their facilities, whether it's um, private houses who often are looking at doing stuff like this, you know, whether it's council-owned property that's outdoors and they're willing to, you know, we've just found this it's just been overwhelmingly positive, I think, our approach when we've been looking at this. And that's the main thing. And so it's it, we've not been turned off by the idea at all. So we're we're still deciding on where the final venue is going to be. We, we want to announce it as soon as possible because that means it's it's gets the excitement going as early yeah. as possible. But there's always I's to dot and T's to cross with things like this. And we need to be happy that it's a venue that we can put on the best show that we can. Um, without compromising the quality that we hopefully display with what you do with wherever it is that we're going to go. Um, so, you know, we want to give, if we're going to do it as an experience, we want it to be an experience for positive reasons, yeah. not for negative ones. <laughs> Great. Right. Well, um, we're running out of time on Zoom, so I guess we probably better wrap it up there. How do people get in touch with you if they want to audition? So what we will be doing is on the 21st, so this, this weekend, all of the audition bits and pieces will go live. They will go live on our website, paradostheatre.im. Uh, so on there, individuals can find an audition form for them to fill out. It's an online form. There'll be all the audition pieces for them to have a think about. And then there's the character sort of profiles as well. So again, something to have a think about. There's a little bit of information about us as a company and how we operate. Uh, and basically, there's a, there's a point on there to say as well, you know, if you're not sure on what you want to apply for or, or how you might want to be involved, then then get in touch with us um, or we'll put some sort of generic uh, audition pieces on there. So somebody can come along and audition for a role and then we will um, we'll consider the best one for them. So paradostheatre.im. And then all of it will be shared across our social media uh, as well. So that's at Paradox Theatre on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and that's the best way to, to keep track. And I say, if there are any questions that anybody might have, then by all means, um, contact us through those channels. There's an email address on there. Or if you know Charlie and I personally, or, or even if you don't, um, just, just get in touch. Um, it's, a, it's an open book. So we're more than happy to, 
to help where we can and, and point people in the right direction. Great. Well, Charlie, Alex, we wish you all the best of luck with your additions and no doubt you'll be back sort of June time and we'll have a have a chat just before the show. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Thank See you, you soon. Cheers. Cheers, Neil. You're listening to the Manx Theatre Podcast with Neil Callan. Right. As Alex and Charlie said, you'll be able to find all of the audition information on their Facebook and social media accounts or at paradostheatre.im. And Parados is spelt P-A-R-O-D-O-S. Just before we go, a quick reminder that the Arts Council funding applications are now open for 2023 and they will be hosting a Meet the Team at the Windsor Coffee Co. on Loch Prom from 5 to 7pm on Friday the 27th of January. You don't need to book a slot, just pop in and have a chat. Well, with that, we bring episode 42 to a close. Thanks once again to Charlie and Alex for joining me on the podcast, and we wish them all the very best for their auditions for The Merchant of Venice, which will be running from the 5th to the 8th of July at an open-air venue yet to be confirmed, or the King's Court Theatre if it's wet. No doubt they'll be back with some of their cast closer to the time to tell us more about the production. Remember to like and follow our social media pages to get notifications of upcoming episodes and events. Don't forget to check out our Spotify playlist by searching for Manx Theatre Podcast, and that's all one word. There's almost 70 tracks and nearly five hours of show tunes there to satisfy your musical theatre needs. If you have any events that you'd like us to talk about or promote on a future episode, you can contact us through our social media accounts or by email to manxtheatrepodcast at gmail.com. Well, all that remains to say thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me again next time. I've been Neil Callan, and you've been listening to the Manx Theatre Podcast. Goodbye. The Manx Theatre Podcast, taking a look behind the scenes of Manx Theatre. Than actors' life for me.